Since my church infiltration video last year, my channel has skyrocketed, allowing me to make a full-time job out of content creation and streaming, focused on tackling tough subjects with depth and nuance. As my most popular video to this day, I've asked myself many times, how can I ever follow it up? If I were to ever do a sequel, I wanted to do something different, but that stayed true to the original, but went in a bigger and grander direction. Something I call the James Cameron approach. But I couldn't just do another church. I didn't want to rush it for a cheap cash in. So I've been waiting for the right idea to come along. It wasn't until recently, when I was doing research for my video on the history of anti-Semitism, that I stumbled across an idea. Something different that still got at the core of my church infiltration video. A leftist trans person going where almost no other left-leaning person would and interacting with the people there to get an idea of who they really are, what they believe, and the state of their movement. But instead of a church, I would go to one of the largest political gatherings of the year, full of conservative thought leaders, politicians, lobbyists, and more. I decided to infiltrate the 2024 Conservative Political Action Conference. Otherwise known as CPAC, the conference has long been a way to gauge the temperature of the GOP and conservative movements in the United States as a whole. Some clips here and there may break into the mainstream, like Michael Knowles advocating uh, transgenderism be eradicated, but by and large, CPAC goes unnoticed by most of society. Except for conservatives. This is a gathering of the biggest representatives of the movement, laying out the ideological game plan for the next year. Which, to me, represented the perfect opportunity. I've spoken about it at length in previous videos and streams, but there are some legitimately high stakes on the election this year. On one hand, we have the sitting Democrat president who's aiding a genocide and refusing to take mental acuity tests. And in the other corner, we have a twice impeached overinflated hot dog costume who is being brought up on federal charges during his campaign and who promises to enact a series of sweeping totalitarian reforms through Project 2025 immediately upon entering office. As of now, Trump is the presumptive nominee for the Republican Party, and many of CPAC speakers echo that sentiment, being close allies or outright sycophants. Which might bring someone to ask why. Why would I do this? Why would I go here? For a few reasons. One, because this election will be pivotal unlike any before. The state of both parties is dire, but conservatives continue to drift into open fascistic nationalism, advocating suppression of enemies and stripping rights, while the comfortable liberals in power barely lift a finger in protest. I am nothing if not curious. I want to know what the conservatives are saying, but also what their fans are saying, how the crowds react, what small talk do they make, how much of this incendiary rhetoric was making its way to their followings. Here I saw a chance to find out in first person, for myself, provided I could blend in. But also, I wanted to go because since Trump, the conservative movement has been a hotbed of grifters. Failed politicians, controversial and incendiary firebrands, canceled public figures. And so many of them have spun their support into podcasts, news appearances, and other products for a brand, much like Trump, including books, lots and lots of books. Like, the first step to being a conservative mainstay is getting a ghost-written book to clog up shelves at a Costco and airport bookstores. So it wasn't just a need to be in the know, to hear what attendees were saying, but also a need to see these grifts in action, to blend into an ecosystem of wannabe influencers and upper-middle-class fail sons all reaching for a piece of that power pie. So, of course, to go into a place like that, I couldn't just come in off the street. This wasn't going to be like a church service. I was in town for five days to attend this. I needed a character, and I needed one who would blend right in. I needed to become Keith, a disgruntled, edgy, upper-middle-class podcast bro. And that took some work. Now, because not just anybody goes to an event like CPAC, I needed a cover story and background work. To become Keith, I had to look the part. That was actually slightly harder than I thought it would be because after three years of light hormone therapy, masculine clothes don't quite fit me right and my face and frame has started to lose its more masculine edge. To cover for that and other factors like pagan tattoos on my arms, I went with a style I like to call saltine chic or as I've been putting it to my partners, my republican cosplay. 
with a mix of thrifting and online purchases, I formed a physical representation of Keith, complete with an unremarkable backstory. Not very rich, but from an upper middle class background, college educated, but a Nepo baby, insulated from the larger world by what privilege he does have. Deeply insecure, but also deeply incurious about other people in the world around him. With all of that in mind, Keith's wardrobe came to consist of beige, gray, and navy. I needed to look like somebody who bought new clothes, but didn't particularly care about style. Someone who put forward a vaguely rough exterior without the experience to back it up. And more than anything else that would help me blend in, I needed to publicly and loudly show what I believed in. For shirts, I bought these two preposterous numbers from Amazon. Presumably, people wear these unironically, but I like to believe they were created only for purposes like these. After seeing footage of the Ronald Reagan dinner at CPAC, I also decided that a more casual look wouldn't cut it there. So again, I went thrifting. I decided Keith didn't have much in the way of taste for style, but was simply emulating what he saw in others, which led me down a path ending in this loose Trump cosplay, tied together with a Brooks Brothers jacket with shiny gold buttons. It really gives the perfect conservative ruse of vague professionalism, giving a sense of status or class and giving the wearer an unearned confidence despite fitting poorly and looking dumb. But I also needed a reason to be there. As Dead Domain, I wanted to go undercover among conservatives, both prominent and obscure, to get the literal feeling in the room on election issues at a time when mainstream conservatism has long ago tilted to open fascism. But as Keith, I had to be on board. I had to be a true believer, and I had to want to do my part for the cause. I needed something that would help me evade suspicion, help me blend in, to give me an excuse to record audio and video, and even take pictures with prominent political candidates and conservative figures, if I crossed their paths. I needed a podcast. So I went through the motions, and thus Patriot Northwest was born. With a little help from a blurry JPEG, I set up a new email and a Twitter account and an accompanying SoundCloud. And because I needed to get followers and I wanted this to look legit, I also paid for Twitter. Setting up the Twitter account itself was a look into how easily people can be led down pathways of radicalization, as simply following one conservative on the platform will quickly recommend additional followers who spout open anti-Semitism, racial slurs, thinly veiled calls to violence, and more. So as Keith, I followed them all, and the result was a nightmarish miasma of hate, but also paranoia. I saw plenty of open calls for revenge, advocating damn near open violence, retweeted by thousands. I couldn't help but wonder how closely the people at CPAC would align with this kind of rhetoric. Would people really readily admit to wanting the violent suppression of others if they thought they could trust me? Or was this just keyboard warriors posturing? Within a few days, I had boosted my follower account. To boost my bona fides, just in case anyone went to check on my name and backstory during CPAC, I spent some time commenting, retweeting, gaining new followers in the process. I want to be clear, um, I was basically just posting total nonsense, just vague gibberish about the deep state and conspiracy buzzwords, padded with racist dog whistles, all for the purpose of building a cover. I essentially typed whatever came to mind, aggregated from the buzzwords I had seen for years and years from places just like this. Impotent rage at women, queer people, people of color, Democrats, and essentially anyone different than me, me being Keith. Based in nothing, literally based in nothing. No convictions, no facts, no proof, just buzzwords. As someone with no online history, who in reality is a trans leftist, it was good enough to get at least a few people to follow me, respond, and believe what I was saying, if not share it. You see, there's this pocket ecosystem on Twitter, like a hollow earth that is just accounts following each other for clout. So my fake conspiracy nonsense would reach accounts sometimes with 90,000 or more followers, all because they followed me because I followed them. A great example of how this infection spreads, when I had less than four followers, some random buzzwords I threw out were retweeted by a gender critical turf to her audience of 60,000 plus people. It was just nonsense conspiracy mongering. And it was spread that easily to that many people. To see how other conspiracies flourish, look at this one, seen by a million people, pushing a disproven conspiracy from libs of TikTok. We talked about this story in a recent video, but this is literally a proven lie. This is not true. The shooter was not trans at all. But in this portion of the internet, where all people want to hear is each other, it gets passed around and latched onto again and again until to the people who put all of their personalities into these online personas, 
this just becomes their accepted reality. And it occurred to me that even if the people I met at CPAC weren't as fervent or open with their calls for violence and racist dog whistles, this was still the world I was stepping into, literally. One based in hearsay, spread like high school gossip, and cemented as truth by fervent ideologues. From here, I also recorded and uploaded two short podcasts to SoundCloud, so I had something to recommend for my content if it came up in conversation. They are literally just nonsense gobbledygook, and I've already probably deleted them by the time this video goes up. And with that legwork done, Keith, a Nepo baby with a podcast dream and poor socialization skills, was born. It was hopefully the perfect cover to ensure I was able to get in mostly unnoticed and investigate what conservatives really said and think when they thought they were in safe, like-minded company. But before attending the event itself, I had a lot of research to do. It would be four days of active conservative political commentary with a special Ronald Reagan dinner on Friday. I didn't know who I'd run into in a hallway or who I'd be seated with at the dinner. So I got to work on homework. I won't bore you with all the details because it would be way too many names up front. I'll talk about each speaker as they come up later in the video. But up front, I do want to talk about the Ronald Reagan dinner and the headliners because they somewhat set the tone for the whole event. CPAC has always played host to a rogues gallery of conservative bigwigs with the biggest of the wigs speaking at the Ronald Reagan Memorial Dinner. Though they should have named it the Nancy Reagan Memorial Dinner because it's mostly just about sucking each other's dick. Uh, previous speakers have included has been Glenn Beck, almost executed homophobe Mike Pence, Ben Carson, and plenty more. This year's speakers were political grifter Vivek Ramaswamy and Bishop Joseph Strickland. In the tradition of such non-winners as Michael Bloomberg, Vivek Ramaswamy, a pharmaceutical company founder, saw Trump rise from an inexperienced businessman to a bad politician and decided, hey, I can do that. After a year of campaigning himself on a vaguely nationalist platform and branding himself as an anti-woke candidate, Vivek suspended his campaign in January 2024 after placing fourth in the Iowa caucuses. If you couldn't tell by his history in the pharmaceutical industry, Vivek is an absolute con man. Despite unsuccessfully trying to garner a guy who just cares about regular people and their issues base, his net worth is almost a billion dollars. In the past, he's defended known scumbag Martin Shkeli. Most notably for Vivek's history, in 2015, he attempted to market a drug for Alzheimer's treatments that failed spectacularly in clinical trials. While he was insulated from the losses in the company because he had shares of that company through another company, tons of people lost a shit ton of money after believing his claims about the drug, which were essentially lies. He has claimed to be a scientist, despite never actually working as a scientist. He's a entrepreneur and financier, and a history of profiteering opportunists just like him lead me to believe that his ill-fated presidential campaign was merely a pivoting point to a political career, rather than an actual effort to become president. On a slightly more humorous note, his campaign paid to scrub mentions from Wikipedia that he had a postgraduate fellowship from the Paul and Daisy Soros Foundation. Yes, they are related to George Soros, the modern ultimate conservative boogeyman. And in hindsight, it's funny he's worried that's what the conservative voting base wouldn't like him for. Unsurprisingly, Vivek's promises were based in sheer lack of governmental inexperience, like he planned on cutting 75% of government jobs apparently, a great way to grow the economy, surely. He said he wanted to use military to destroy Mexican drug cartels, which just sounds like basically declaring an international war. Yet for all his posturing, he couldn't quite manage to get mainstream conservatives in his corner. Probably because, as several news articles have noted, a lot of conservatives mistook him for a foreign-born immigrant and a Muslim, neither of which are anywhere near correct. Ah, the Tigers Eating People's Faces party strikes once again. The other heavy hitter at dinner time would be Bishop Joseph Strickland, a Texas bishop who was personally fired by the Pope. Now, what did he do to deserve such a sanctified workplace ass-whipping? He wouldn't stop talking shit about Pope Francis. For those who don't know, the Pope is like the final authority in Catholicism. Like the, the head cheese. Always has been. Bishop Strickland accused the church and the U.S. of having a deep state, a dog whistle referring to an implacable and unnamed cabal of puppet masters working to undermine America. It's a conspiracy theory popularized by Trump and parroted now by most of the GOP party line. He also spread fears about COVID vaccines being a method of mass population control. He's now retired at a crisp 65, meaning that he gets to make rounds at events like this, probably write a few books, and get perpetual guest spots on Newsmax and Fox News. 
probably to help affirm people's fears about the deep state, something I need to be clear he would know nothing about. With those two tastemakers out of the way, this is where I leave you for now. Because I'm sure there will be so much to talk about, I will be doing this in a video blog style from here on. This has been all recorded before I leave. Tomorrow, I leave for Washington, D.C., flying all the way across the country to be around people who, if they knew who I really was, would likely hate me or at least treat me different simply because I'm transgender. If they knew I was trans, they probably wouldn't feel comfortable speaking to me like a regular person. They wouldn't trust me to take part in their narratives. Yet, as a straight white man, I'm going there to listen to people who advocate violence against trans people, who want to strip people like me of medical rights, make it illegal to be seen in public. And that's just how some conservatives, not all, feel about just me. That's far from an exhaustive list of how they feel about others. From the time I leave for the airport, I will be representing myself as Keith. And I will be interacting with the world as an aspiring conservative influencer. As promised on Tuesday, I left the house wearing my full Trump regalia. Without being too awkward and nosy, I tried to pay attention to if people treated me any different, if they avoided me, if they give me bad looks. In about 20 minutes, as I made my way to the terminal, I received instead three compliments, mostly on my Let's Go Brandon hat, including one compliment from a TSA agent. I had a mostly uneventful flight to Minneapolis and a brief layover that due to a runway delay, I had to run across the Minneapolis airport to make to my next connecting flight. Thankfully, the connecting flight to Washington, D.C. was much cooler. It wasn't nearly as cramped and full, and I got there with relatively little issue, managed to pick up my bags, and there was an Uber driver waiting to take me to my Airbnb. After a long day of flying and contemplation, my nerves had abated somewhat, and I think the reality was starting to sink in of what I was really doing here. I went to sleep and woke up the next morning, took a shower at the Airbnb, and left to go to National Harbor and pick up my badge for the events to come in the next couple days. I got up nice and early and was greeted with some hot tea from my wonderful Airbnb host. After spending a day locked in a sweat tube of a plane, I showered and then camouflaged my scent with cheap aftershave that wouldn't be out of place. I chit-chatted a bit with my host before leaving. She had two rooms available and I only rented one of them, but it was nice to have the bathroom and facilities to myself for the morning shower. After leaving, I walked about an hour to the venue, which was actually a lovely, brisk morning jaunt that at one point took me through the woods, gave me time to clear my head and get into the mindset of a mediocre white person by listening to Eminem, but only post-relapse material. Upon arriving at the convention center, I saw some of what I assumed to be groipers, looking like tall children in suits and America First hats, like racist Slenderman. In past years, Nick Fuentes and his America First Political Action Conference have held rival events across the street from CPAC. I'd been keeping an eye on Telegram for any notice of another event, and in hindsight, I regret not waving down the kid in the America First hat to try and get in good with the group then. It was the closest I'd felt in real life to a scoop lost moment in Dead Rising. Despite claiming he's not afraid, Nick Fuentes sure does try to keep his little events a secret. Last year, he held his speech after Trump, so I decided to wait and see if another opportunity would present itself. Anyway, once I got into the hotel, I tried to find the badge pickup. I was unaware of the massive opulence on display at this particular establishment, which featured a large atrium with smaller houses inside of the large hotel. While wandering the halls, I heard a familiar sounding voice. I turned around and there was Mike Lindell, probably better known as the My Pillow Guy. We will talk plenty more about him. He was off in a corner rehearsing a speech with some handlers and I didn't want to bother him just yet, though it was already surreal to see someone I had heard about for years who had the personal ear of the president at one point just schlepping around a hotel hallway. I finally found the War Room event, which would take up most of the day and was run by Steve Bannon. Bannon was the former chief strategist for the Trump admin, former Breitbart chairman, and current talk show host of the War Room with Steve Bannon. While he became persona non grata to Trump, Bannon has always played to a more nationalistic audience and even calls himself a proud Christian nationalist. He has since come back into Trump's good graces and constantly praises the MAGA movement, and at this event he acted like he was selling Trump like a product. He's praised Putin, has been personally influenced by Nazi filmmaker Lenny Riefenstahl, and was pardoned by Trump on charges of embezzlement and fraud he was found guilty of during the Build the Wall campaign. 
and this is who the conference is starting with. One thing I didn't realize about Bannon is how he really spreads nationalist fears about China, and the possibility of getting into a shooting war with China, which was the running theme of the day. I tried to find a seat, observing my surroundings and doing my best to not look too awkward. I kept my ears open. I expected a degree of political talk, but I guess I didn't expect every sentence would be such a cliche. I'd hear small snippets as I walked by, like they should have stayed in their own country or the election was stolen. It quickly became clear to me that this convention wasn't just a meeting of middle-of-the-road conservatives or fiscal conservatives, classical liberals, or any of the other various tangents of America's right wing that aren't explicitly cool with MAGA. As Bannon's event unfolded, it became crystal clear that this entire four-day event was specifically for Trump and his base. There was a spread of hotel buffet food, and having skipped breakfast, I partook, leading to this particularly surreal moment on stage as I scooped up my hotel egg noodles. Trying to get this republic back to where it once was, to essentially make America great again. The noodles were just fine. Bannon took the stage, announcing that the War Room was working towards book and film initiatives, echoing other attempts from outlets like the Daily Wire. He also throws some red meat to the crowd, decrying the Fed surrection, referencing a conspiracy theory that federal troops staged January 6 to arrest true patriots and make Trump look bad. On top of that, they're trying to keep him off the ballot and trying to try him here for this ridiculous made-up insurrection. They're trying to actually, they're trying to charge him for the Fed surrection, right? He mentioning this is very funny in a few minutes. One by one, he introduced other mainstays and producers from his show who all seemed to bask in the spotlight to varying degrees. He invited a lady up to speak for Israel and basically say America is turning its back on Israel and they need our help more than ever to finish cleansing Rafa of Hamas. She also said Hamas was literally the same enemies as the Taliban, which isn't true. Here's the thing. I'm not going to go through every talking point Bannon says and disprove them for two reasons. One, it would clog up the entire video because there's so much dumb shit being said. And two... These talking points would be repeated ad nauseum for the next few days, so if I skate over a topic here, odds are I will cover it elsewhere. Next up was a major player in Angel Studios, the studio which put out last year's lie-filled propaganda piece Sound of Freedom. For a conservative movie, Sound of Freedom was massively successful, at least on paper, as there's been something fishy about the pay-it-forward ticket system. He took to the stage to reveal a new trailer for the dramatic biopic Cabrini from the same director as Sound of Freedom, Alejandro Monteverde. Real quick, just watching some footage of this movie. This is the trailer they played. I want you to imagine what licensed song they got to play over this footage. I'll give you a second. Okay, was the song Shania Twain's Feel Like a Woman? I'm willing to bet it wasn't. After this, we saw a few more Bannon buddies, including a former colonel in Navy intelligence who had a book to sell on how China wants to kill us. We then get an extended spot from Alex DeGrasse, whose main thing is rallying conservatives for voting in very specific elections to make the most of red gains in the upcoming election. He worked as senior advisor to GOP House leader Elise Stefanik, where he notably launched plenty of false accusations and slander against media members, according to this editorial from the Adirondack Daily Enterprise. Bannon interacts with his guests with the cadence of a late-night infomercial host, and treating them to shill their own websites and products to the audience like they were giving a sweet deal on a blender. Most interesting to me was during the event, he makes a host of claims that the Trump campaign was essentially a grassroots movement and that compared to other campaigns, Trump hardly had any money, capital or backing, just the will of the MAGA movement. This, of course, is said to pump up the crowd, but its blatant propaganda is incredibly not true. From OpenSecrets.org, we can see that not only did Trump bankroll his campaign to the tune of $66 million, almost 20% of the total, but that large donations from backers made up an additional 14% with $46 million raised. While Clinton far outpaced Trump for 2016 funds raised, this likely had more to do with other candidates like Jed Bush raising more before Trump was the actual nominee. Trump also wrote $50 million off of his taxes because of his campaign bankroll, raised 26% of his small funds from small donors, and raised over $350 million in total. So by any metric, he was far from a grassroots candidate. This is just a lie. I had been having trouble with my phone battery, so I dipped out to find a power bank in the hotel's gift shop and took a bit of a lunch break. 
Afterwards, I was back to it where Bannon and the people on stage praised Project 2025 in some pretty scary terms. And I can't wait till we take over in January 2025 when we start to go through all the records and we see exactly what they've been doing in the Ukraine. We see about the bioweapons labs. We see the child, we see the child, the child trafficking. We see the organ harvesting. And then when we put them on trial, it's going to be real trials in front of juries. And they're going to have to answer not just to a jury, they're going to have to answer to God himself of what they've done. As an open nationalist, I wasn't surprised to see Bannon advocating we'd get revenge on all the leftist and deep state actors who very likely didn't exist, but it was surprising to see maybe 200 people holler in agreement, saying not just that the people responsible for overturning the last election would be brought up on charges, but also brought before God, which sure seemed like a euphemism for being executed, especially in tandem with accusing them of treason. And I think that's what the crowd understood too. Here was the reaction. And this seems like a good time to segue into Project 2025. Project 2025 permeated the entirety of CPAC and is probably the most worrying and important discussion to have around Trump's bid for re-election. Spearheaded by a collection of far-right think tanks, including the Heritage Foundation, Project 2025 is an open plan for authoritarianism that has been prepared for Trump essentially as a government in waiting to roll out as soon as he gets elected. The entire plan is over 900 pages long, so forgive me if I haven't read the entire thing myself. It's largely a mishmash of distinct policies aimed at nearly every single sector of governance to bring anything from tax law to free speech moderation into the most far-right position possible, and when I say that, I don't mean more free speech. It doesn't help that Trump has already said he'd be a dictator on day one, which is not a good look, but Project 2025 looks to cement him being a dictator every day after that too. It's an overhaul of the government at every level to cement the president and executive branches having essentially absolute power over the processes of every other branch. Conservatives are using the unitary executive theory to argue that this is a good thing and has precedent, and should Trump be elected, Project 2025 will hit the ground running on a 180-day plan to restructure massive amounts of the government, including intelligence agencies, to bring them under Trump's direct control. From the New York Times description of the unitary executive theory in Project 2025, quote, The legal theory rejects the idea that the government is composed of three separate branches with overlapping powers to check and balance each other. Instead, the theory's adherents argue that Article 2 of the Constitution gives the president complete control of the executive branch, so Congress cannot empower agency heads to make decisions or restrict the president's ability to fire them. Reagan administration lawyers developed the theory as they sought to advance a deregulatory agenda, end quote. And the various think tanks associated with Project 2025, as well as Trump's cadre of sycophants and allies, support Project 2025 because it basically guarantees them a piece of the pie. It's propped up by millions from dark money donations. It massively prioritizes cutting regulations, particularly those meant to keep watch of corporations doing environmental crimes or finance crimes. From New Republic, quote, Along with the advisory board, altogether more than 90 groups have signed on to Project 2025. Some have received substantial contributions from Heritage, nearly $1 million according to tax filings obtained by Accountable.us and reported by NBC News. That accounts for 58% of Heritage's total giving in 2022, the year Project 2025 began. Around 40 of the Project 2025 groups have also received funding from Leonard Leo-linked dark money groups, for instance, more than $16.5 million from Donors Trust in 2022." End quote. I'll give you one guess why so many people with so much money want this to go through. Because the massive deregulation would mean they just get to make even more money. It would give the president direct control over the FBI and who in the government is being investigated, which doesn't seem great for someone who's even recently admitted to doing crimes on television. Trump is no stranger to pardoning his friends and allies who have been credibly convicted of crimes. I feel the need to remind people that Steve Bannon was found guilty of crimes and pardoned by Trump among plenty of other people who received favors from Trump that we will talk about over the next couple of days. But he wouldn't have to pardon them if the law were made to say specifically target only his political enemies, justified in the MAGA mind because Trump has actually done crimes that he's been caught for, and Trump and his campaign have continually just pushed that as being targeted by the left-wing deep state radical Marxist mafia or whatever. And then there are the cavalcade of other far-right positions represented, like Project 2025's promise to rescind the citizenship of over half a million dreamers, or nationalized citizens, 
deporting them to countries they've never known with no recourse. It will criminalize abortion at a federal level and keep surveillance on women who travel to other states to get abortions as those laws go through in order to compile criminal cases on them. It would completely do away with discrimination protections based on gender, race, or religion, meaning anyone could discriminate against people for housing and jobs based on those things. It would order the CDC and medical organizations to stop gathering data on transgender and non-heteronormative identities, broadly telling major medical organizations to work under rigid, outdated, and disproven medical ideas. Literally, just to spite trans and queer people as part of a rigorous Christian nationalist agenda. Like, they'd essentially just act like trans people don't exist, and they'd legally get to claim that because they're rewriting the laws to say so, and they're rewriting all the data to say so. It's hard not to see a similarity here to the Nazis attacking and burning the Hirschfeld Institute, if I'm being honest. It advocates for conversion therapy and also wants to outlaw pornography. If you're curious what they define as pornography, it's not just actual porn they want to ban, but also bend the law to include definitions that are just meant to target queer and trans people, even outside of a pornographic context. And don't take my word for it. Here's the words of the Heritage Foundation founder, Kevin D. Roberts, quote, Pornography, manifested today in the omnipresent propagation of transgender ideology and sexualization of children, for instance, is not a political Gordian knot inextricably binding up disparate claims about free speech, property rights, sexual liberation, and child welfare. It has no claim to First Amendment protection. Its purveyors are child predators and misogynistic exploiters of women. Their product is as addictive as any illicit drug and as psychologically destructive as any crime. Pornography should be outlawed. The people who produce it and distribute it should be imprisoned. Educators and public librarians who purvey it should be classified as registered sex offenders. And telecommunications and technology firms that facilitate its spread should be shuttered. End quote. And if you're asking what educators and librarians are giving out pornography, that's your hint that they don't actually mean Hustler or Pornhub are being handed out at libraries. They mean anything LGBTQ related that they can, under these new laws, reclassify as pornography. Anything having to do with what they deem quote unquote transgender ideology. It doesn't matter how graphic or innocent the content is, they will classify it all under these auspices. So teachers and librarians stocking sex education books, even non-graphic books that may have a trans character, could be classified as sex offenders under these measures. They also say that any private companies that allow porn of any definition should be shuttered, which sure does seem like an authoritarian overreach, but who cares because they want a literal Christian nationalist state, their words, not mine. Yes, a large portion of the Project 2025 rhetoric comes down to essentially doing away with any notions of separation of church and state to infuse laws and literally legislate a narrow view of Christian morality for the entire country. Not of loving your neighbor, not of following any of Jesus' actual words, be they for loving one another or against rich people, but for the things Bibles barely mention, like queer people and abortion. One of the main people behind this Christian nationalism in Project 2025 is Russell Vogt, who explicitly aims to use the government to spread Christian doctrine. Christian nationalists like to hand wave fears about separation of church and state by saying America was founded on Christian principles for Christians. That isn't true, but even if it were, it was still founded to create an egalitarian approach to belief, and many founding fathers were agnostic. The true reason behind this nationalist agenda is an attempt to unite the country under an ideology that can easily isolate and target any outgroups as enemies. It's not easy to target your enemies when they look like everyone else, but when you can easily designate them, you gain a target-rich environment to pursue your legislative agenda. An agenda I feel the need to remind you would be almost entirely up to Trump and the overhauled ultra-conservative government Project 2025 seeks to install. The thing that makes Project 2025 particularly dangerous is that it represents Trump, an actual criminal with a long history of shady dealings and cover-ups, flanked by sycophants who can use his presidency to push their most radical agendas, and who will be protected by his overriding control of everything. It is a deeply troubling thing to see so many people advocate for, and if pushed through in its intended state would strip so many people of necessary rights and freedoms. It would use the auspices of one party's beliefs to override the democratic process at every level, taking federal control of issues that even conservatives have fought to keep decided at a state level. It's an outright betrayal of what conservatives say they're about, and while, like most things MAGA and Trump, it's been denounced by more mainstream conservatives, the crowd at Bannon's event here loves it. If not for the idea of forcing others to live by their rules, then for the idea that they will get to punish whoever their ideological opponents are. And as the crowd excitedly responded to, 
The idea that those ideological opponents may even get killed. To this crowd, they've come to believe that all people who would get hurt are the bad people. There's no way Trump's policies would backfire on the voters, right? Actually, these sweeping changes, much like Trump's other political stunts, would economically and socially impact conservatives just as much as other people. What about gay Republicans, conservatives in the Latino community with immigrants or dreamer relatives? His policies, like those of any president, affect everyone, which means at some level or another, at one point or another, these targeting of liberties and forcing of moral codes will hurt conservatives too, just like his previous administration. And the problem with Trump's fervent cult of personality, which it became clear made up a majority of CPAC, is that they won't believe any of that. Just all the nice people, I uh, just love everyone coming together as a family yeah. and united. It's, everyone's united. Is Liberty dead or is she alive? With Trump, she is alive. Anyway, back to Bannon. We then get comparing Trump to Washington and other great men of history, more fear about China and more advocating the possibility of an open shooting war. Matt Schlapp comes on stage talking about what best to do at CPAC. It's a lot of the same deep state paranoia, but with an extra heaping of humanizing Trump as Schlapp tells the audience Trump comes to CPAC to see the little people, the grassroots. This is a commonality that develops from people like Bannon and Schlapp, building the audience up as truly important for supporting Trump. It happened a lot on the main stage too, mostly from rich assholes who have an absolute financial interest in making sure Trump gets support. Schlapp also slips up a little bit and says the quiet part loud, telling the excited crowd that there are two outcomes in November. Either they win or the election is stolen. You all know the, how this story ends. In November, we either win or they're going to try to take it from us, right? Those are the two outcomes. And we gotta win. It's such a succinct look into the extreme worldview everyone here is being sold into. While they're also saying that nobody wants to interact or engage with them and are calling them extremists, they literally tell their audience that they can either win or the game is rigged, like a spoiled kid on a playground making up rules so he can constantly win, yet getting mad when nobody wants to play with him anymore. We then get some stage time from professional internet troll Jack Posobiec. He talks about social media, but says they will finish the job that started on January 6th, referencing the insurrection. All right, welcome. Welcome, I just wanted to say, welcome to the end of democracy. We are here to overthrow it completely. We didn't get all the way there on January 6th, but we will, we, we will endeavor to, oh, oh, to get rid of it and replace it with, with this right here. We'll replace it with this right, right. here. Amen. That's right. Earlier, in the beginning moments, Bannon had called it the Fed Seraction. So if it was a Fed false flag, how are they going to finish it? Unless, of course, they just like to change goalposts to suit their arguments. But would they lie to these people? Yes, yes, they absolutely would. Posobiec talks about social media and the movement and advises how people should effectively organize online to do online activism, which for him seems to amount to just sharing posts. After this, it was time to go get badges. We waited in line for a while, I had my QR code prepare and my fingers crossed I would get in without having to show ID. While I was waiting in line, I heard a couple people talking about getting their property damaged for having Trump signs on their lawn, getting those signs stolen or their cars keyed because they have Trump flags or Trump bumper stickers. When I got to the front, I printed my badge without a problem with my fake name, Keith Webb. However, when I was instructed to get a lanyard, I couldn't get one without proper ID, ID matching my given name. I was sent to a support line, and after 20 more minutes, I explained my situation to the person at the counter. I was incredibly nervous, but did my best to not show it. I had come so far, and getting kicked out of the event now would really suck. I told him that my legal name was different because I used it for my podcast and on screen, and I didn't want to be doxxed. He understood and thankfully waved me along. So much for security. Pro tip to any journalist worried about using their real name. They seem to basically not care at all at CPAC. So there I was with my lanyard and pass. I perused the half set up show floor with a few booths in various stages of assembly. There seemed to be a patriot or otherwise right wing branded answers to everything. There were silver supplements, a militaristic and violent payment processor advertisement, patriotic coffee, and even some kind of standing board for weight loss that advertised, quote, exercise the right way. It reminded me of the Wii standing boards I still found occasionally abandoned and gathering dust in the lower shelves of Value Village and other thrift stores. The booths were still being set up, so I found my way to other parts of the event instead of bothering the attendants. I wandered to the second floor where various talk shows and stages were being set up, including Newsmax, The Epic Times, and more. And towards the end of the hall, I heard a familiar voice again. It was none other than Mike Lindell, standing by his own booth, taking pictures with a loosely gathered assortment of fans. 
Of course, I didn't want to miss an opportunity like this. How often do you get the chance to take a picture with a pillow celebrity? I flexed my best awkward starstruck white man look and stepped right up. For his part, Mike seemed out of sorts, wandering back and forth between pictures as his handler wrangled him into place. He wasn't particularly engaged with anything that his fans said to him, mostly waving them away and feeling like he wanted to be literally anywhere else at the moment. I decided to leave and spend some time decompressing and taking in the sights. It's probably the only night I would have to myself, and it was my first time in D.C., and I wanted to see the capital like a proper tourist. I walked around downtown D.C., saw the monuments, took some pictures, and grabbed Shake Shack for dinner. I also got waved away from a fence by a secret service because I took the wrong path in front of the White House parking lot, and I'm willing to bet my Trump gear didn't make me look better. After this first day, I was exhausted. I headed home planning to upload my footage and possibly record some audio. And when I got back to my Airbnb, I was met with a twist. My host was welcoming her second guest for the week. And upon introducing us, I've learned that the guest, whose name I've changed to Mark to protect his actual identity, had flown in from Dallas to also attend CPAC, which meant that my intention of recording every night went completely out the window. The walls are too thin, and it would absolutely blow my cover to talk about all this stuff as it happened, which is why I recorded all this back at home. But at the time, I decided it was a problem for another day and went to sleep as my footage was uploading. I went into Thursday surprisingly exhausted. Today was the first day of regularly scheduled talks, so it would be a series of conservative TED Talks from here on out on various grievances and topics. However, I had also been made aware, in keeping with the groypers I had seen the day before, that there were some legit Nazis afoot at the conference. Not Nick Fuentes, but actual close associates. Through Amanda Moore, a journalist who had been denied a media badge in keeping with Bannon and Schlapp's mandate that no left-wing journalist would be led into the event without buying a ticket, I had heard about these Nazis. I found out that Amanda, despite buying a ticket, had also still been kicked out. Amanda Moore is an investigative reporter who spent 11 months undercover in far-right Nazi groups and helped to expose several prominent members. I'll list some of her work and investigations down below. Now, for obvious reasons, she is not really liked in those spaces. They recognized her, and soon after, she was kicked out. But despite that, Ryan Sanchez, someone with close ties to Nick Fuentes, was allowed to attend for all the days with his cadre of SS cosplaying high school friends, I'm assuming. They were also seen here mixing it up with known white supremacist and race science advocate Jared Taylor. Taylor is the founder of American Renaissance and is a well-known racist and self-professed quote-unquote white advocate with a career dating back decades. He's a big advocate of eugenics and differences in intelligence between races. Unsurprisingly, he was a big Trump guy in 2016 and called Trump's inauguration a quote sign of rising white consciousness. Back to the gang of dorks running around in their dad's oversized jackets, and Ryan Sanchez, the leader of these little rascals. Ryan is a former leader of the explicitly Nazi Rise Above street fighting gang. He's been close friends in the past of Nick Fuentes and neo-Nazi Baked Alaska, who was at the Charlottesville Unite the Right march. Sanchez has been a longtime Trump supporter, defended January 6ers on OAN, has advocated and spread pro-Trump election conspiracies, worked with Identity Europa, and was kicked out of the Marines for being too explicitly racist. Anyway, all of these guys openly support Trump, have histories of brazen white nationalism and racism, and were allowed to attend the event for every one of the four days. And plenty of journalists documented their inclusion no matter what lies the CPAC chair wants to spread. But enough of these nerds. After a day of being in a room with people hoping for an open shooting war with China, I was looking forward to mixing the grievances up a little bit. In particular, I was hoping to get a finger on the pulse of wokeness. I had spent the previous day trucking my winter coat around the venue. I decided to just go with a shirt ensemble and my I identify as non-binary t-shirt. I want to give special mention to this shirt because it's an absolute mishmash of just conservative buzzword nonsense. Seriously, what does this mean? I identify as non-binary? It's, it's obviously just the one pronoun joke, which conservatives find hilarious, but then there's a gun. What, what does that mean? Is that a threat? Is it just there because conservatives love guns? This entire shirt is just a version of jangling keys, and let me tell you what, it absolutely worked. This was a huge hit. Before even the main stage event, I had no less than five compliments and at least three people who wanted to take a picture of the back of my shirt that I had bought on Amazon. Anyway, I caught my host as they were about to give Mark a ride to the convention center and figured I'd save myself an hour of walking and tag along. It gave me a good chance to see what particular brand of conservative he was. 
Turns out Mark was a Republican organizer from Dallas. He originally didn't support Trump. He thought Greg Abbott was a phony who did some good stuff, and he loved Gab founder Andrew Torba, but dispelled any notions of anti-Semitism. I like Andrew Torba quite a bit, the guy who founded Gab. Right, yeah. He, he paints Gab as some anti-Semitic blah, 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 whatever. I can't stand that. You know, I think that's a, the basis thing in the world. When you start talking isms, you're trying to divide people. Right. Talk good and evil. And if something's evil, call it evil. But when you say ism, it's a way to divide people. It's just identity politics. Correct. Yeah. It's baseless, man, or it's very base. I don't like it. To be clear, Andrew Torba is incredibly anti-Semitic. This wasn't the only time Mark would say something that made me raise an eyebrow about anti-Semitism, by the way. But that is a conversation for later. Upon getting to the hotel and convention center, I noticed it was much more full than the 200-ish in attendance for the previous day's War Room event. One person told me there were at least a thousand in attendance, but I kind of doubt that. It was definitely more than Tuesday, but apparently far from what CPAC is used to, and the massive venue went roughly half full pretty much all day. I decided to kick off the day by browsing the fully set up booths into vendor hall. The show floor was also much smaller than I anticipated. Looking at footage of previous year's CPAC, I figured the vendors would be pulling out all the stops for 2024. Instead, I got a small grid of Trump merch padded with various grifts and useless politically branded products, the worst of which included a booth for Woke Tears brand water, which wasn't even available to buy at the booth itself. There was also a January 6th pinball machine, with pinball machine doing a lot of work to say a screen rigged to some buttons with wonky physics. The game featured such modes as Babbitt murder on the screen, and while I did see Ashley Babbitt's mother on the floor, I didn't get to ask her how she felt about her daughter, who was shot dead by Capitol Police for attempting to murder them, being included in a cheap pinball game. I also saw this group advertising themselves as TIFFs, or trans-exclusionary anti-feminists, which is a dumb name because TIFFs just sounds like what you call teeth when you're talking to a baby cat. The John Birch Society was also represented. Uh, which is a far-right think tank that has been active since the 1950s where they were regarded as extreme and fringe for pushing conspiracies like Eisenhower being a communist. However, in this conspiracy-happy climate, they're more than welcome to spread New World Order fears all over the damn place. And on the show floor, I would get two more compliments on the non-Bidenary shirt. Later, I would interview some folks around the vendor hall, including the Woke Tears crew and the creator of MAGA Hammocks. But the talks for the day were about to begin, so I found a seat in the ballroom off to the side, but still pretty close to the first row. Perhaps to be expected, the event kicked off with a solemn Pledge of Allegiance, then an incredibly overdone national anthem that felt underwhelming when faced with the quarter-ish full massive ballroom, then a televangelist-style prayer. Christian nationalism, like I said, is the name of the game here, a concentrated effort to affect government from an explicitly Christian viewpoint to push out any other religions or ways of life, and they do not even remotely care to hide it. Then we get a Newsmax ad. I was unaware that ads would play constantly on the show stage throughout the day, but of course they would. As I got deeper into the day, it felt more and more like the whole of CPAC was just an endeavor to sell more stuff to gullible rubes, which, again, shouldn't be surprising. I'm just surprised at how blatant it was. A trailer for a January 6th documentary starts an unsuccessful attempt in the crowd to start a free J6 chant. Apparently, the woman leading the chant included Ashley Babbitt's mother, and these ladies would continue unsuccessfully to start chants throughout other speeches, including trying to get a USA chant going that quickly and awkwardly died down during Byron Donald's speech. After the opening previews, I guess, Matt and Mercedes Schlapp emerge on stage. To absolutely nobody's surprise, Matt Schlapp is currently embroiled in several lawsuits over his sexual harassment issues. He's been credibly accused of trying to silence voices who have come forward about him harassing and groping young men who are put in various positions close to him. And I know what you're thinking. Closeted homosexuals in the conservative movement? Oh, very much so. And do I have some messages to show you later on that very topic? Because I know for a fact that there are at least a couple dozen gay men at CPAC. Now, how do I know that for a fact? You'll just have to find out later. The pair are immediately reminiscent of televangelist megapastor duos with their stilted camaraderie and pre-rehearsed dialogue. I look around as the event is finally kicking off, and from a front view, the place seems maybe a third full, if I'm being generous. The schlaps conjure the crowd's vitriol by playing to many of the same things Bannon had the previous day. Biden is a dictator who stole the election, the fate of the country hangs in the balance, and Trump is the only one who can save us. 
Matt calls for aid to Israel, which, along with completely ignoring the 30,000 dead in Gaza from Israel's attacks, becomes another trend that emerges. The first speaker of the day is Byron Donalds, a Florida congressman whose entire career was in the banking industry and high finance before entering politics. CPAC not doing great at keeping money out of political interests. He starts off talking foreign policy, saying Israel should obliterate Hamas. He gets into anti-China fears before saying he wants our military to be G.I. Joe again. G.I. Joe. Like, I just want our military to be G.I. Joe again. I think that's what most people want. That's what I want. And I don't know about anyone else, but a sitting representative saying he wants our military endeavors to be akin to a children's cartoon is worrying and silly. If this is the metric we're going by, I want our military to be Transformers, and I want our religion to be Bionicle. He then spread some fears about police getting beaten up by roving gangs of immigrants. They'll talk about this story throughout, but at CPAC it's depicted as the police being unable to protect themselves and the perps just walking away. Seven people from this story were arrested, but twisting it plays into their law and order narrative that since Trump, police are afraid to be tough on crime because they might be canceled. The reality is that 2023 saw a record number of police shootings, so they seem to be doling out violence just fine. He talks about gas drilling and he's pro-fracking, which is a disastrous environmental practice, but it does make oil people money. And speaking of making rich people money, he's anti-crypto regulation, which has been a huge scam so far because it's not been regulated by anybody. Since the crypto bubble popped a few years back, it's basically gone away, but not before 2023 would see users lose an estimated $2 billion in crypto scams. Which, honestly, fine, don't regulate crypto. If you're stupid enough to invest real money, you probably deserve to lose it. Right after saying everybody should be treated equally, we get him saying gays are against the natural order. Our country is best when everybody is treated equally under the law. Little boys are little boys. Little girls are little girls. When I was a little boy, I liked little girls. This is a good thing. This is the natural order that keeps society progressing. I look around and the venue's still half full when he gets off. We get a couple more commercials, including one where Mercedes saying Biden is like Fidel Castro. And already at this point, combined with several hours the previous day of similar rhetoric, I was exhausted, but more from boredom than anything else. Coming to CPAC, the largest gathering of conservative voices, or at least advertised that way, seems like I'd be listening in on boring but at least vaguely informative talks on economic issues, getting deep into the nitty-gritty on why Biden's policies fail, why Trump is better for the economy. But over and over again, these complex issues were simply reduced to wokeness or communism. By the way, words like communism, leftism, democrats, Marxism, Leninism, socialism, wokeism are all interchangeable here to these people. While I want to say the onstage speakers know that Nancy Pelosi and Joe Biden aren't radical Marxist communists, it's hard to tell, and the important thing is that the audience definitely believes they're communists. They probably couldn't tell you what communism is, but that's what they think the Democrats are because the people on stage keep telling them. Next up, we had talk show host Ben Ferguson and Senator Tommy Tuberville speaking of blaming everything on wokeness. Ben Ferguson is a C-tier talk show host who works for Glenn Beck's Blaze Network. Tommy Tuberville is a sitting senator from Alabama. He's mostly unremarkable and toes the party line. If there's something that sticks out about Tuberville, it's that he's a political opportunist who has violated stock rules over a hundred times and, unsurprisingly, advocated against making those rules more stringent. I feel like a history of blatant profiteering is all you need to know about a politician to know where their true allegiances lie, on any side of the aisle in their bank account. We get another spate of brief trans panic. I've been up here three years and I've seen all this mess and it starts with what's going on with our family, with our kids, and with this crazy idea of gender. They want everybody to be the same. And it's, uh, you can't make it up what's going on up here. You really can't. But I'm for school choice. We have to get... These bizarre fears about gender and trans and kids get brought up continually throughout the conference, but uniting these discussions is a distinct feeling that the people talking about them don't know anything more than to let the audience know they think they're bad things. Tuberville additionally has a history of these behaviors. 
There are no sources, no studies cited, even bullshit ones from their own side, no data or statistics. They just say Democrats think boys can be girls or make a joke like call me old fashioned, but I think women's sports shouldn't have men in them and will get raucous applause. The crowd merely just applauds for mentioning woke ideology. This is the kind of jangling keys mentality we will see again and again, though interestingly, while this is a far-right talking point that has taken over the last few years, elections and data continually show these radical anti-trans positions aren't broadly popular outside of right-wing circles and don't win elections. He tries to link it back to Christian values because everything here is towing the party line. Everyone here is MAGA and needs to be pushing Christian nationalism, but with Trump as their savior instead of JC. And this is kind of how most of these talks go. They just say something, making sure to fearmonger about it with no proof, or just throwing out already accepted and well-known conservative talking points as proof. There's no deeper analysis to any issues here. There's nothing below the thin surface veil of Democrat thing is bad. The thing I noticed though, that's enough. Enough to elicit literal and genuine rumbles of fear from some audiences over ridiculous and inaccurate claims. He then, of course, pivots to culture war issues. He brings up Caitlyn Jenner, which leads to misgendering in the audience when referring to Caitlyn. And he pivots from trans fears back to Donald Trump. This is another commonality between so many of these speeches. Being CPAC, it's not too wild that so many would openly endorse Trump as the presumptive nominee, but what is odd is how almost any issue is made to pivot into an endorsement. He then talks more about the FBI and Deep State taking away kids from their parents. He advocates conservatives taking over school boards because they hate Christianity. And then on that tip, he spreads fears about persecuting churches. None of these things are happening or will happen, unless those churches and parents are doing something illegal, by the way. Unless they're talking about this Washington bill, which we talked about being misrepresented in my hate church infiltration video. So no, there aren't any Christians or conservatives being punished for their beliefs. There are, however, states that are punishing parents who get their trans kids proper health care. But we won't see him talking about those parental rights. These things, like the fears about transgenderism, seem to elicit more reaction from the audience than even talking about economic issues in China. To the audience, these issues have been cemented as something directly happening to them right now. They think these things are genuine threats to the point of drawing reactions when they hear them mentioned. He ends his speech by saying communists have taken over the country. Go back in your communities and take over what they've stolen from us. It's, it's the rights of the American people, the greatest country ever. And Again, we're not going to have many more chances. Uh, I hope we can get it back to this point. Now, the next 10 months is really going to be a, uh, a test for all of us. It's going to be a huge test. They're coming after you. They're going to come after you. They're going to look at They're going to vilify you. You're going to see everything in the world said about Donald Trump, your local conservative uh, politician. Next up was Mark Robinson. Robinson has also advocated trans women be arrested for using the correct bathroom for their gender representation. He has repeatedly called queer and trans people filth. That's low on the list of slightly worrying other things he said, like blaming a globalist conspiracy for Trump losing in 2020, and that the movie Black Panther was created by a Jew to cheat black people out of their shekels. And that is, that's a quote. He's also said black people owe reparations for slavery. Not, not they are owed, they, they owe reparations for slavery. I'll be real though, this guy is a good speaker. Of all the evangelical wannabes, he seems like an actual fire and brimstone preacher. And his rhetorical arguments felt powerful because of how he successfully appealed to emotion. After the boring talk from transphobic Alfred E. Newman, Robinson brought down the house comparatively. I should mention by now that we are three for three on transgenderism being brought up in derisive and oversimplified tones. It should be noted by the way these folks argue, there's no wiggle room for any good ones like Caitlyn Jenner or Blair White. These definitions leave any trans person as simply a man playing dress up, living as a threat to women everywhere. But then most of his speech is about the media not liking him. I wonder why he would be such a big Trump fan. Pretty soon after we see him turn it into a literal sermon. And then he gets to discussing freedoms and military victory. And this is where he's a pretty darn good speaker. I actually feel something like... I believe that he at least believes the crazy shit he says, which is more than I can say for a lot of the other speakers I'd see. When he gets off stage, they play a MAGA hammocks commercial, which just, I don't know, man. Like, what what, what do I say about this, honestly? The next talk was called Catfight, Kamala versus Michelle. 
run by a guy named Matt Boyle, who, like, honestly, he looks like a guy named Boyle. Uh, and Kurt Schlichter, who is competing with Matt Schlapp, for whose last name sounds most like the sound they make when they're honking off to their dream of a fascist state. And it's a conversation about Michelle Obama being a Democratic nominee. It's just a load of speculation interspersed with conspiracy and is actually pretty boring. These speakers just parade the same jokes about Biden being old and Biden being stupid, but apparently he's also a masterful manipulating dictator. It's a point that nobody can seem to agree on across all the speakers. But I guess they also think that Obama is really controlling Biden through the deep state. Towards the end, one of the speakers brings up the passing of Andrew Breitbart and how great he was. From the audience, I heard the only time I've ever heard an audible aww for someone saying untimely passing of Andrew Breitbart. But I had skipped breakfast to catch the ride to the convention center, so I needed to take a break and eat and return for Laura Trump later. I went down to the little cafe in the hotel atrium and looked for something to chow down on. As I left, I couldn't help but note how sparsely attended the event was. I came across Bannon's booth playing some kind of anti-Chinese Chinese Chinese rap video on YouTube. I continued about my way, just listening and eating food in the atrium. Behind me in line, a writer for the Post Millennial introduced himself to two other young attendees. The Post Millennial is home to Andy Nyo, who is notably a massive liar and terrified of milkshakes. And when I sat down, a loud table nearby began to catch my attention. They were talking about someone losing their credibility and being Russian propaganda. Through context clues, I gathered they were talking about Tucker Carlson. I listened some more, and they were spreading conspiracies about people jailed for January 6th. One woman in the group talked loudest, leading the conversation through a series of declamatory statements. After a bit, it turned out that loudest voice is a lawyer, and her client was sitting with her, and was a whistleblower for trans surgeries. They were sitting with two other people. The lawyer is Marcella Burke, a free speech lawyer who has had leadership roles in the Texas State Bar Association and a number of funds and endowments. Marcella calls Severino a hero, shit talks DeSantis for using handlers on Twitter, and how that meant he'd just be another puppet if he got in office. Like, no, Marcella, actually I think Mr. Pudding Cups needed someone to help him refine his public image. They then got to shit-talking Ted Cruz. Apparently after the Cancun incident where Ted was found fleeing his state and shirking his COVID responsibilities, Marcella claims to have texted him and told him to just own the Cancun situation and just say federalism. Like, boom, federalism is a good argument for an elected official taking a vacation out of state when the working people who elected him and pay for his lifestyle are undergoing a crisis. I had enough of them and decided to go back to the show floor, where I was greeted by an ad for Moms for America. And my favorite part of this ad was where they just show Trump, even though he doesn't say anything. Like, he's literally just on screen, and there's no reason, because other people are talking. They then get into a pretty long video making pro-Palestinian protesters look like they're representing Hamas. It is very obviously made to look scary with a spooky noise background loop. But why aren't they showing any images of the 30,000 dead Palestinians? Probably because CPAC can't waver from Israel support. It ends with a scene of Mercedes asking, who's funding these young protesters? Why is it only happening in academia? And who's pushing anti-Semitism? I don't know. It couldn't be the fact that kids are sticking up for what they believe is right. Why is it only happening in academia? Gee, Mercedes, could it be that it happens more at places where people are more open-minded and learn about things? Unlike here? It's also hysterical to have her saying, who's pushing anti-Semitism when there was an anti-George Soros talk on the main stage on this same day? Described by me as the dumbest smart man alive, Ben Carson is apparently a brilliant brain surgeon and a bad politician. Like, the ratio for how good he is at surgery and his amazing medical accomplishments is so bizarre. He was Secretary of Housing and Urban Development under Trump after a failed presidential bid, and now he does stuff like this, just talks in very sleepy tones about things he's deeply unqualified for. Carson's somnambulant tone seems to almost immediately put the half-full audience to sleep, myself included. He spreads fear of transgenderism being child abuse to applause. As we see every day, virtually every single institutional power in our country has become openly hostile to conservatives, to Christians, to our country's legacy. Our education system has been taken over by radicals 
who push insane political ideologies like CRT, DEI, transgenderism. And you know, they're putting all this stuff over on our young people who have brains that are not fully developed yet. And to take somebody who's curious and impressionable and infect them with these kinds of things is nothing less than child abuse. Uh, Again, from a conservative thought gathering, I figured we'd see more nitty gritty, but even the guys who are former Trump cabinet members can't seem to muster deeper thoughts than trans bad. And why would they when it's a line that gets such fervent applause with no facts or citations needed? Next up is Laura Trump coming in at a rough 41. Laura Trump is Trump's daughter-in-law, and that's all the qualifications she needs, apparently. Honestly, I'm surprised Eric and the failed Donald clone didn't drag themselves away from thinking about Biden's junk long enough to make an appearance. The family's aspirations for becoming a political dynasty are at this point well known. Laura is a Nepo baby who, as early as February 24th, said if she were elected to co-chair of the National Republican Party that every single penny will go to one and only job of the RNC. That is electing Donald J. Trump as President of the United States and saving this country, end quote. At least we know she's not for checks and balances, right? Which is probably fitting because Laura here is just working a campaign rally. She's talking as if issues under Biden weren't also Trump's issues, and going over just Trump's literal campaign talking points. We got another anti-trans talking point from Laura before saying she believes in a meritocracy. Which means competing against other biological girls. And I want her to understand that in the United States of America, we get ahead and succeed by merit and merit alone. I will never raise her to rely even for one second on the poison and lie of identity politics. Which is a wild thing to hear from someone literally only here because of her proximity to Trump. But hey, whatever gets you the job that pays, right? We get uproarious applause when she mentions she is running for co-chair of the RNC. She then says, I don't care who you get to vote as long as they vote the right way, which feels like letting the anti-democratic mask slip just a little bit too much, especially for a movement so interested in election fraud as it is. This truly feels like a by-the-numbers campaign speech, incredibly generic, perfectly manicured for maximum applause, and much like Laura's bone structure, completely fake. Next up is a talk about George Soros, who they oddly infantilize as Georgie Soros. They open by talking about the epidemic of opioids and fentanyl, how criminals don't fear the law because there are no stops in place, and more fear-mongering about how Biden, despite being an idiot who can't do anything, is also a dictator. Let's talk about the line that law enforcement doesn't work in the country, because it's brought up here in connection to Soros, but is a claim we see again and again, usually in tandem with talking about Trump as a law and order president compared to Biden's America having devolved into some crime-filled hellscape. Conservatives, especially of the MAGA contingent, really like repeating the claim that under Biden, crime is up. Uh, Under Trump, things were much safer. From here, they will pivot, usually, to referencing George Floyd protests and cities being burned down as far as the eye can see, and that liberal Marxist Democrats have engineered all of this by defunding the police. Would it surprise you to know none of this is true? Broadly, under Biden, crime is overall lower. Part of this is likely due to a surge of jobs under Biden due less to his policies than the end of the COVID pandemic. People working means they don't need to resort to crime to solve problems. Under Trump, joblessness fell to a half-century low of 3.5%, and Biden has continued that streak, increasing it to 3.7% as of December 2024. Many of these victories have been claimed by both Trump and Biden's campaigns as reasons for why they're the economically beneficial candidate, but honestly, it likely has more to do with a rebounding economy in the wake of a mishandled pandemic, which both parties were to blame for. So it's just fixing problems the Democrats and Republicans caused in the first place. But more hiring has a knock-on effect on crime. This has been clearly shown in studies examining the effects of joblessness during the pandemic and the sharp rise in crimes across several major cities, which, funny enough, also happened under Trump. While the conservatives who took the stage seemed to act like the George Floyd riots happened under Biden, they didn't. It was Trump's leadership, or lack thereof, that led to the cities being burned down, as they like to say, even though that's a vast over-exaggeration meant to inspire fear in the easily scared suburbanites they cater to. But it also turns out that high violent crime is something to worry about more 
mostly in red states. In fact, stats show that the same 25 states that went to Trump have the highest murder rates in the country and have since the year 2000 and have steadily increased over time. Broadly, murders went up 30% under Trump in 2020, which again does correlate to a rise in crime after the pandemic, and it should be noted it was the first rise in the murder rate overall in the previous four years. However, for red states, cities with Republican mayors, and states with GOP governors, rates of violent crime are higher by sometimes 40% compared to comparable areas under Democrat leadership. Trump and other conservatives spent the entirety of CPAC claiming that New York and California were overrun with lawless gangs, murder rates had spiked. The reality is that no violent crime is drastically higher in red states like Louisiana, Mississippi, Arkansas, and Texas. The places that love to tout how their lax gun laws lead to safer cities are literally just lying about that. As always, my sources are sourced in a doc listed down below, and each of those sources has their own little sources for you to dig into, so knock yourself out. Since the BLM and George Floyd marches and riots where protesters called for defunding the police and a few Democrat lawmakers thought, hey, maybe we don't need to spend billions of dollars for police to have military-grade hardware, Republicans have run with the idea that all of the Democrats want to defund police, and many even just say police have been defunded all over the country. This also isn't true. The Minneapolis Police Department, which was responsible for George Floyd's murder, did defund. But otherwise, in these supposedly lawless Democrat-run cities, police budgets expanded across the pandemic once the protests died down, though noticeably to only slight changes in crime because as we've seen time and time again, expanding police services doesn't actually prevent crime, it just creates more abuses of power. Which was the whole reason behind a movement to defund the police so that they don't have tanks and we can try and advocate for a more community-oriented approach. But whatever, America, let's just keep having incidents like this, where a woman answered her door with a legal gun in her own home, and police responded like we trained them to around law-abiding citizens, apparently. Officers unloading more than two dozen rounds through the front of the apartment. One deputy reloading her gun and continuing to shoot. Go down, go down. Go down. A woman on the other side of the wall identified as Ebony Pouncey shot several times. Charles Paul, we need people shot fired. Republicans like to lie about these issues because it plays to their law and order image, selling a vision of peace and safety to people who have likely never been near even any of the riots that broke out a couple years ago. In reality, they're simply lying, and facts and statistics show, per capita, red states are more unsafe. Either way, though, a shocking number of crimes go completely unsolved, which kind of begs the question of why are more police hiring? Why do they have military gear? Why have their budgets been expanded? but they don't seem to be doing the jobs that everyone claims they do so well. Policing, its impact on the economy and crimes across states are all incredibly complicated and interwoven issues that there are no simple solutions for, but that won't stop conservatives from misrepresenting facts to push their narratives that Joe Biden is a Marxist who's taking away police. We will see these claims several more times over the next days, and now you know how they're almost entirely BS. Back to the stage where we begin talking about lawfare. The mushy Kurt Angle wannabe sets up another guy to say the Democrats are using Soros prosecutors to target political enemies, which is exactly what every person has pledged Trump will do upon entering office, something by now we've seen several speakers openly admit and talk about. This talk seemed to only mention Soros in the title for brand appeal to get people to show up, because honestly, it had very little to do with him. I grew bored again and antsy, and felt my effort maybe better spent elsewhere. I decided to go see how the vendor floor was doing. As I perused the vendor hall once more, I noticed more people trying out the Wii balance board, and this suspicious gentleman who was sporting a lab coat but didn't really look like a scientist. I tried out the January 6th pinball game as a kindly man held my phone. As a fan of digital pinball, it was clearly made by somebody who knew the genre, but something in the physics were off, making the lanes hard to hit, and a lot of these zones were unintuitive. 4 out of 10. I noted the Trump bus in the corner of the room was now full of signatures covering his face, neck, the entirety of the bus. This got me thinking that there were so many different scribbles and signatures on the bus that someone could probably write something and it would be days before anybody even found out. So, did I write something? I made my way back up to the second floor and wandered down the row of podcasters, radio hosts, and other niche conservative boomer influencers I had never heard of. I don't know the context, but I walk by with perfect timing to see this child being interviewed. It was around this time I ran into Bishop Strickland arguing with a British news anchor. And then I saw these two, which is, I, I don't even know what else to say. I, I saw them. 
And on that note, I want you to know the gargantuan, Olympian levels of self-restraint I'm showing by not insulting the appearances of literally thousands of people. For example, the groups of large college Republicans and the large groups of college Republicans. I ran into the MAGA rapper himself, Forgiato Blow, whose artistry we've looked at on the channel. In our photos together, he appeared to be trying to look even more awkward than the look I had practiced, leading to these absolute works of art. I popped back into the main stage and saw some gas company execs talking about how great gas is. Two of these ding-dongs are Tim Stewart and RJ Burr. Tim Stewart is an oil lobbyist working for a tax-exempt 501c organization where he pulled in a nice crisp $200,000 salary in 2022, so a real man of the people. RJ Burr is the CEO of Panex Oil & Gas, an American gas company and part of a family dynasty that has been looking to get investors. He's a third-generation oil man, and he's done plenty of talking in the past on the benefits of oil, especially monetarily. The greatest trick the environmental, environmentalist ever pulled was convincing the world that oil was bad. Because that, that is, that's been one of the greatest tricks they've ever pulled. Because without oil, there is no modern world. And, and so, like it or not, that's what it is. Well, there is a chance. Why can't somebody come in and consolidate all this? Start buying up all these properties. If you had a chance to get into something that you knew everybody needed and nobody else for some reason wanted it, you'd be sitting in a pretty good position. Well, that's, a, that's the exact scenario we have in the oil and gas industry right now. So all of these people are running from oil. Well, man, I'm a kid in a candy store. We, we can go through and kick the tires. We don't have to buy anything, but we have now a wealth of potential reserves that we can go through and just purchase what we want. And I wonder why these two would be interested in less regulations under a new Trump regime. Anyway, better not think about what lobbyists and CEOs have planned because did you know oil companies are actually the little guy? And like so many other talks today, this quickly became another one that was just boring me to tears as it devolved into more open partisan hackery and they talked about Biden's social engineering. Like, I don't think he could engineer an ice cream social and the dude loves his tasty treats. I was ping-ponging around looking for something to keep my attention when I ran into Michael Knowles doing a spot on the Alex Lace show. I decided I needed to ask him something, so I blended into a group of younger Republican college students and waited to ask him a burning question. Hey, really quick up? question. Yes. Is Matt Walsh as grumpy as he appears on camera? Much grumpier, actually. Really? Much. You have no real. idea. Very abusive. <laughs> Monstrous. <laughs> You know, I actually, I believe, it. I believe it. After having my curiosity sated, I needed a break from the humid, packed interior. As my partner bleakly put it, you know it smells crazy in there. I acquired a bubble tea and went back to the convention center, refueled for the final stretch of the day, or at least attempting to gather what strength I had left. I walked into the main hall in the middle of Dave Sunday, who sounds like a children's TV show, talking about how conservatives definitely believe in rehabilitation and restorative justice. A Reagan propaganda movie trailer played, and it looks preposterous, but I am curious how closely it actually adheres to the well-documented history like Nancy Reagan's fellatio skills. Next up was Would Moses Go to College? And it claimed to be a talk all about stopping Jew hatred. In reality, it was about spreading propaganda that anyone advocating Palestinian rights and freedoms was a hateful anti-Semite, and it was just all about ending anti-Semitism, but from an ultra-right Zionist angle. As seen in the protester footage earlier, CPAC has no interest in the civilians in Gaza that have been killed now to the tune of an estimated 30,000. By now, millions have had their homes razed and are without power and water as an even larger humanitarian crisis threatens to spread disease among the terrible conditions in places like Rafa. This is far past the point of an attempted genocide, and apparently that's the way Republicans like it. On stage, they took the ultra-Zionist approach that anyone who defends Palestinian civilians or points to how Hamas is a result of the Israeli government's long-suffered oppression of Palestinians is in fact a Hamas sympathizer and a terrorist in their own right. They basically blamed all of the deaths in Palestine on Hamas, says protesters have hatred in their eyes and are Jew haters. Don't forget that to this audience, colleges are woke propaganda factories, infusing children with Marxism. So, in a world where all of these evils are interchangeable like CPAC, this is an easy pill for the audience to swallow. He also cites 50% of people supporting Hamas. This is a talking point popularized by Vivek Ramaswamy. Mention one statistic, 50%, five, zero, 50% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 34 years old 
say that Hamas's October the 7th terrorist attack against Israel was justified. So what is going to happen, God forbid? However, as noted by PolitiFact, this is not really the conclusion of the poll cited, as three other similar polls received drastically different results, and many of the answers contradict the students supporting Hamas, leading me to personally believe this poll was an outlier of being poorly worded and misunderstood. At least, that's just my reading of it. Anyway, this statistic caused audible reactions from the crowd as they kept talking about how terrible and woke our institutions are making our children. Failed actor and transgenocide daydreamer Michael Knowles was next up on the schedule, and that pretty much sums him up. Despite a healthy career, Knowles has become an also-ran of other Daily Wire personalities like Shapiro and Walsh. He's just kind of there, one notch above Andrew Clavin. And I know what you're saying. Who's Andrew Clavin? My point exactly. During my brief time observing Michael and talking with him in the hallway, he comes off as incredibly affable in that finely polished way you'd expect of an actor. Of the speakers who took the stage, he had some of the best timing and rhythm. It's a shame that he sold his soul to show for people like this, because under other circumstances, I think he could have been actually a pretty cool guy. He also has never really seemed to have the same deep hatred as people like Matt Walsh or Jack Posobiec, despite some of the radical things he said. Much of Michael's act was spreading more fears about the border invasion, how diversity isn't our strength, and how we are losing our Western identity. Again, these are radical claims, but all within the party line. These claims edge just slightly out of Nazi territory, but close enough that the conference, as I mentioned, still had and welcomed Nazis. It's great replacement theory. It's the 14 words, just a few steps away so the more centrist-minded conservatives won't get wise to the broad racism of the party platform. The great replacement theory is a fraud, by the way. It's an ethno-nationalist talking point that gets regurgitated plenty online, especially recently on Twitter by known idiot Elon Musk. Unsurprisingly, for anybody who watched my video on the history of anti-Semitism, it can be traced back to anti-Semitic conspiracies about Jewish people undermining the West by using migrants, which was popularized as an idea in white nationalist circles in the violent revenge fantasy The Turner Diaries, which depicts a lone warrior killing the enemies of the Aryan race. A number of mass shooters have also ascribed to these same fears, including a shooter who killed nine people in a black church in 2015, the Pittsburgh synagogue shooter in 2018, and the Christchurch shooter in 2019. So it's super cool and normal to have so many people spreading these hateful and debunked talking points. Gee, I wonder why MAGA draws in so many Nazis and white nationalists. If you want a good breakdown of why it's such a dumb theory, I fully recommend Sean's video on the subject, which I will link down below. Back to Michael, who is advocating open Christian nationalism like many others have, and it's here that it begins to feel like a PragerU talk, which Michael has also done. From my brief experience observing him, Knowles feels incredibly polished, to the point of being basically a mirror for whatever ideology is pointed at him. He doesn't seem to have a personality, aside from being a passively good-looking automaton towing the party line. And his talk was kind of just tame and lame, and maybe it was just because I'd been watching this shit all day I felt that way. And it was around this point that I decided to leave. It had been a long day of walking and talking, and I had two even longer days ahead of me. There had been so many blatant lies constantly spewed that were so readily and wholeheartedly ready to be believed by the audience and attendance that I felt like I had really fallen down the rabbit hole. Except instead of the Red Queen, it was the Orange King, and the crowd would just cheer and applaud whenever he said off with their head. So with that, I leave you this first video of my CPAC experience. There is still so much more to talk about, and arguably the most nightmarish and surreal moments are still ahead, including Trump's speech, a variety of interviews I was able to do, including with the owner of the Woke Water Bottle Company, and... Oh, shit, I totally forgot to mention, I've been on Grinder at CPAC the whole time. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for watching this first part of my CPAC Undercover Project. If you follow me, you know that I have been teasing this for a while, and I've kept it mostly under wraps, except for some hints I've given to my patrons. Speaking of which, uh, this wasn't cheap, and believe me when I say I have the craziest stuff still to come in part two, which includes a variety of interviews with people like Lady MAGA, the Donald Trump loving drag queen, uh, the Woke Tears Water Company, MAGA Hammocks, and just, just so, so much more. This was a truly bizarre and surreal experience for me, uh, and I hope that you find this journalism valuable as a look at the current state of the conservative movement in 2024. That being said, 
That being said, please be sure to like, leave a comment, and help get this video out as much as possible. I do do this for a job, and this trip in particular was not cheap, from the disguise to the plane tickets to the actual event itself. Like I said, all of the crazy stuff is still yet to come, including me showing off, and I'm sorry about having to end it on a cliffhanger, uh, including me showing off the grinder profile, and yes, there, there were definitely some undercover gays at CPAC. But all of that I need to leave for another video at another time. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you look forward to the follow-up. In the meantime, thank you very much for watching and have a great day.